Welcome back. We return to our top story now. Saturday's deadly racist attack in Buffalo, New York, that left 10 people dead, three others wounded. Cedric Holloway joins me now. He is a former detective and SWAT officer with the Buffalo Police Department. Thank you so much for being here, Cedric. This is a terrible loss for the community that you served. Tell us, what's your reaction to what happened? Uh, it was it was absolutely shocking because uh, usually Buffalo doesn't get anything like this that happens. So when I heard that there was a, a, a shooting, an active shooter, as a matter of fact, uh, literally one or two blocks away from where I was having a, a youth program, it was it was very shocking, very. And Cedric, I mentioned that you had served in the Buffalo PD. You actually knew retired Lieutenant Aaron Salter, who was killed in the shooting. Tell us about him. He was a very mild-mannered individual. Um, he retired because he wanted to take it easy. So, uh, and, and it's my belief that the security job was that way of just still holding on to a little bit of law enforcement, but not with the demands of being a police officer. It was a very, very mild-mannered, that personal blame individual. Cedric, police managed to take the suspect alive. Does this surprise you in a case like this? And, and how do officers convince a shooter to surrender? Well, usually the verbal commands do the job. Uh, if, if the individual is willing to give up, uh, verbal commands are the first thing that they try. Uh, it was my understanding that this individual had a gun to his own head and officers talked him out of shooting himself, if you will. Um, so usually we would ask the bad guy, say, hey, put the gun down, uh, get on your knees. We would exercise control over the individual and take him into custody without incident, usually. Does it surprise you? A lot of people are talking about the fact that he was taken uh, alive. Does it surprise you, though, that that was, that that was possible? It, it was um, surprising. Uh, active shooter situations usually uh, the, the shooter self-inflicts. Uh, we've had several situations where that's been the case, such as Las Vegas, uh, Sandy Hook Elementary. Uh, those situations are when the police arrive, the bad guy does something. Either he gives up or he self-inflicts. And uh, this situation, the bad guy gave up. So since he was taken alive, he's now uh, facing trial. He's pled not guilty. Walk us through what happens next in the investigation and what law enforcement hopes to learn by having him alive and answering questions. Well, um, the benefit of having him alive and answering questions is to figure out what exactly his motive is. Uh, I, I understand that he submitted a, a, um, a document explaining his movements and what exactly his plans were. Um, and what's next, he, he's, uh, he's already been arraigned and he will be given a, uh, an, an attorney and discussions will be made with, uh, with regards to the attorney and the state and whether a plea is going to be um, met or whether he's going to be going to trial, trial or not. Um, he's facing a lot of time. Uh, there's, there's very few who face the, the, the crime that he's been charged with and he planned these murders and I believe manslaughter, um, first degree, I believe, is the case, uh, what he's been charged with, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. That's what we have heard as well. Uh, police also say that the suspect live-streamed the attack on social media. How, how concerning is this for you? What does it tell you about his motivations? And, <laughs> and what we also heard from the governor about potential for copycats. Right. So... In my opinion, this is a copycat itself. So there was a situation, uh, Brenton Tarrant in 2019 in Christ Church, New Zealand. Mm -hmm. He went about the same method of an a, uh, active shooter. Um, same markings on his weapon. He had some bizarre markings on his assault rifles and such. Uh, it was GoPro recorded. Uh, he had a manifest also. And as I look at the video from... Yesterday's shooting, compare it to the 2019 Brandon Tarrant shooting, they look exactly the same. What do you think we do about 
that sort of thing. I, I know that, that SWAT team members train and prepare for this, and law enforcement officials say that they've learned so much following Columbine and all these other mass shootings, but can law enforcement ever be truly prepared for a situation like this? I think so. Um, so with the Buffalo Police Department, what we did was not only were we training SWAT, we were training patrol officers, uniformed officers on active shooter response, because the fact is that those individuals are already on the street. They're doing a regular patrol. They'll get there a lot faster than SWAT. When I got the call in the middle of the night or whenever, my job was to make sure I notify my team, make sure I assigned individuals to go get our equipment, and then we rallied up. And it would be 20, 30 minutes before we get on the scene. Patrol. Mm -hmm. They're already patrolling the streets. They're already out there. They're the first responders. So it was important for us to teach and train patrol and street officers, active shooter response techniques. Cedric, the governor is blaming lax gun control laws and calling for a national response. I'm wondering, what do we know about the guns that the suspect had? And especially in the case of, of your colleague, former colleague Aaron Salter, we know that he, he was trying to stop the shooter early on and shot at him, but the tactical uh, protection, the tactical gear that the suspect had um, prevented him from taking him down. Tell us more about how your job, how the job of law enforcement officers are complicated by the availability of this type of tactical weaponry. It's, it's uh, severely challenging for us, especially when we're outgunned by individuals on the street. Um, there's a call for officers to be able to carry something that's more powerful, such as the weapon that the, uh, the bad guy had. Um, in the case of with, uh, Officer Salter, he didn't have uh, the equipment to be able to battle something like that. But how do you prepare for an individual with an assault rifle coming into the grocery store? That's really something that you're really unable to uh, prepare for. Cedric, as I mentioned in the beginning, this is your community. You have served it. At, uh, it must strike you as particularly difficult, even as you're coming on and talking to me with your wealth of experience professionally. I want to give you an opportunity just to speak about how you and, and others in Buffalo are feeling in this moment. We're, well, I'm going to tell you, there's, there's a lot of anger. So the place where I am giving this interview from, it's uh, two blocks away from the site. At the time of the incident, I was here with a bunch of kids, approximately 20, 25 kids, uh, and we we're doing the workshop. And this thing is going on down the street, so it, it, it affects us personally. Were Literally, you hearing some it? Some of my kids walk. Were, it, given that yeah, it was only two did. blocks away, and, and you were with children absolutely. as this was happening, and you were you were hearing it unfold. Absolutely, I was hearing it. I was receiving text messages from. Uh, law enforcement uh, officers who who know what my background is and are questioning uh, uh, next steps and things of that nature, uh, they were asking my opinion on how things are going. And I absolutely, while it was happening, uh, my kids were finishing up the program. And what I did was I locked the door because I wasn't sure whether this individual had been uh, taken into custody or not. I locked the door. I allowed my kids to finish the program. Um, and only until at the, the end, when I was uh, assured that the individual was taken into custody, did I let them know exactly what was going on literally down the street. So it's, uh, it upset a lot of folks. It scares a lot of folks. Uh, we've got mixed emotions. The facility that I mentioned is now serving as the center for grieving families. Uh, we've got several agencies here, including the Red Cross, that will... Um, bring in uh, families who are grieving loss to be able to counsel them with regards to uh, coping um, next steps, if you will. And it's still early. A, a lot of folks haven't wrapped their mind around the situation. And uh, there was an employee of TOPS who came here. Uh, she happened to be on break when this all happened, heard the gunshots lock the door. She came and she received some counseling and, and and i think that's absolutely important for us to be able to uh get help 
um, to recognize the fact that there, everyone needs uh, someone to talk to and talk this out. How traumatic that experience must be, not only for the people who are worried about their loved ones, but, but folks within the community and those children that you were watching at that time. Cedric, thank you so much mm -hmm. for sharing all of your experiences with us. My pleasure, my pleasure.